Welcome to day three of the Girton Festival um, and this session on the consequences of women's enfranchisement. Um, it seems to me that over the course of the last two days we've talked in quite broad terms about Girton College and we have these broad categories, originality, resilience, excellence um, emblazoned all over the marquee. Um, I, I just want to spend a moment to think about specifics to move from the general to the particular. Um, do we have any history graduates here? Excellent. I mean, you'll be delighted to learn that um, this year, the Girton class who graduated on Friday, we had five firsts in history, all women. Um, so yeah. when we talk about the college as a place where excellence thrives, that's what we mean. Um, it's my enormous pleasure this morning to introduce my friend and colleague, Lucy Delap, um, who is a fellow of Murray Edwards College, formerly Newhall. Um, Lucy first came to prominence with her first book, The Feminist Avant-Garde, which transformed our view of the intellectual history of feminism on either side of the Atlantic, and she followed that up with an acclaimed study of domestic service, knowing their place, available in paperback. Um, but she's also written extensively, she's written about the history of shipwrecks, about the history of feminist bookshops, about the history of religion in the 20th century, um, about the history... Um, of uh, religion and masculinity, and in everything that she's written about, her work's been characterized by extraordinary analytical power, extraordinary empathy, and extraordinary methodological innovation. She's one of that handful of people whose work defines where the cutting edge of the field is. And this is nowhere more evident than in a recent project she was involved in, which sought, sought to study historically the phenomenon of child sexual abuse in Britain since the late 19th century. Um, work which won the Royal Historical Society's prize for public history. Who better then, when Penguin Books were looking for someone to write a new history of global feminism, um, inevitably they turned to Lucy, and quite rightly. So we have no better guide today um, to tell us about women's suffrage, did the vote change anything. Please give a very warm welcome to Dr Lucy Delap. Thank you so much, Ben. Thanks, everybody, for coming. That was quite the nicest introduction I think I've ever had. Um, it's super to be here. I'm all too well aware that coming as a fellow from Murray Edwards, from Newhall as it was, my college wouldn't be there if it hadn't have been for the determination of the other women's colleges and some very senior Gatonians uh, to make that, that third foundation for women uh, happen. So I remain enormously grateful. So I'm going to talk today about... Um, 101 years since women first uh, voted in the national franchise. I should say women, but it's only some women, of course, because it was 91 years uh, um, since uh, all women have voted, because it was women under 31 who voted um, uh, from 1918. But also 101 years since the first woman took her seat as an MP. And I'm going to talk not about this, the very familiar story about how that process happened, about the uh, the suffrage campaigning, but rather about the difference that women's enfranchisement made, both in terms of uh, feminist campaigning, but also thinking about policy and the ways in which women were incorporated into British politics. Now, it's a great time for us to be thinking about this, not only because of the, the various centenaries that we're celebrating, but also because I think that today is a time when gender issues and gender equality are very much to the fore in British public life. Britain has had a women's equality party since 2015, as uh, I'm sure you all know, founded by a former Gatonian, uh, Sandy Toxvig. And that is um, the first uh, women's political party since uh, 1917, when one was formed in anticipation of women voting in 1918. We're witnessing a time today when we can no longer really take party affiliations and the kind of boundaries around parties for granted. It's an extraordinary time of fluidity, of change, of smaller parties pushing at the mainstream, of mainstream parties splitting and uh, uh, factionalizing. And the story that I'm going to tell today is one where women's enfranchisement created a similar kind of febrile atmosphere of party fluidity, of aspirations for change, of a spotlight shone on gender equality issues. But where those aspirations for change, at least in part, were strangled by the hold that the mainstream parties had on British political life. So today I'm going to focus on three things that changed 
as a result of women's enfranchisement, uh, and three things that barely changed. The, the areas of change, we'll look at feminist campaigning, we'll look at the, uh, the policy world, and particularly women's influence on policy, and we'll look at women's political influence outside of those kind of formal um, legislative and party structures uh, as hostesses or in rituals of um, uh, canvassing and hustings and so on. The areas where we'll look at much less change will be the personnel of politics, who gets to uh, represent us politically. It'll be the area of party domination, the hold that parties have on our political imaginations and our political landscape. And it'll be on the overall political culture. How do we do politics? What is the common sense of politics? So let's start out with feminist campaigning. Tactics changed after 19, 1918 away from these very familiar um, uh, and quite extreme episodes of violence that were there in the kind of closing uh, days of the, uh, the women's suffrage campaign. You can see here an arson attack. Those quite well-known militants, um, uh, the Pankhursts and all their supporters in the Women's Social and Political Union stepped back. And in their place came some much less well-known figures, but figures who were willing to cooperate with the existing structures of British politics, who were trying to gain victories for women through departmental committees, select committees, through lobbying, through writing newspaper articles and books. And historian Brian Harrison has described the feminists of this period as so-called prudent revolutionaries. Some of the topics on which they campaigned are still quite familiar to us today. Equal pay, for example, that was a very uh, powerful um, uh, debate that was had across most of the 20th century and, and, and still, as you know, into the 21st century. Uh, there was very little progress on equal pay uh, until the 1950s, but it was one of the major uh, goals of uh, feminists after the suffrage victory. But I want to take you back to some campaigns that were much less, uh, uh, that are less likely to be familiar to you today. Campaigns that were quite hard to build a consensus around. And one of the most important after um, uh, 1918 was that for family allowances. It was a campaign that was trying to break the hold of the male breadwinner, trying to break female dependency on husbands or fathers through a series of payments made by the state to mothers. Sometimes this was called the endowment of motherhood. And it had been boosted by the small payments that were made to uh, the wives and the mothers of soldiers during World War I. So that had sort of tried out that policy idea. And feminists were very keen to keep going with those payments and broaden them out to all women. So in 1917, the editor of a collection of feminist essays called for endowment to replace what he called equal pay for equal work as the battle cry of feminism. But this was a policy that caused quite a bit of discontent uh, and controversy. It may not surprise you that much that the male-dominated trade unions were very much against it. They saw it as a, uh, a plot by employers or well-meaning well campaigners to push down male wages. And they had a strong preference for what they called the family wage, paying men uh, a, a premium wage, whether they had a family or not, to ensure that they could uh, uh, support their dependents. But it wasn't just uh, the big unions who were opposed. There was also real pessimism in the feminist movement itself. The Six Point Group, which was one of the most um, prominent of the uh, interwar feminist campaigning groups, feared that family allowances or endowment of motherhood would just anchor women in the home profoundly place them in that domestic realm, and that whether you had children or not, you'd be regarded as an actual or potential mother, so that women couldn't then step forward and take that kind of full citizenship role that had been hoped for. They also feared that it would transfer the dependency of women from uh, men to the state. They were quite um, concerned about what, um, what that role of dependency would mean in women's lives. Another major controversy in this period, and again one of the issues that was splitting uh, uh, the feminist movement, was the question of the protection in the labor market for women workers. This meant banning them from working at night, for example, or working in so-called dangerous trades. And I say so-called because that spectrum of what counted as a dangerous trade 
ranged from things that were really obviously quite dangerous, like working with lead paint, to things where the danger was much less evident. There was an attempt to, um, to make bar work for women a dangerous trade because of its, um, uh, its moral dangers. <laughs> Many feminists feared that if you uh, protected women in this way, it would mean that they weren't equal competitors with men as workers, that they would be more expensive as workers and therefore they'd be excluded from the labor market. Of course, there were also supporters and lots of women who worked in industry were very, very keen to get any kind of protection they could from what was often a very, very uh, tough work environment for them. So on major issues, there wasn't much unity in the 1920s and 1930s, and that limited the power of the so-called prudent lobbyists to, uh, to make change happen. It was only really in relation to church feminism that the militant tradition continued. The Church League for Women's Suffrage, which was the main Anglican body, uh, changed its name in 1917 to the League of the Church Militant, fantastic, resounding uh, title. And they honed their, um, their focus in on the ordination of women, where previously they'd been campaigning on a whole range of uh, women's issues. Uh, they decided to um, focus deeply on ordination and interrupted church services, uh, picketed um, uh, church bodies through soot at clergy and generally made a fuss. Uh, of course, we know that there was no progress on that issue until the, 19, uh, the 1990s. And in the 1930s, the, the, the League of the Church Militant also stepped back from active campaigning. So when we look at tactics and campaigning, we can definitely see a change after 1918 and after 1928, full suffrage. Uh, but uh, something of a dip in the energy and the profile, the visible profile uh, for feminist activism. Now, that doesn't mean that no change was made. If we turn to my second area of change, which is women's influence on legislation, we can see some quite profound changes. Pat Fain, who's a, a historian who's worked quite closely with Girton, some of you may know her, um, uh, argues that um, uh, campaign successes resulted in women being allowed to join juries in 1919, getting appointed as magistrates from 1920, joining League of Nations delegations, gaining birth control uh, rights, divorce reform, preventing alcohol sales to, number, to, to, to those under 18, uh, equal guardianship for infants after divorce, and other reforms of that kind. And my own work on child sexual abuse shows that that issue really shot up the public agenda after women were enfranchised, after women MPs were in parliament, were asking difficult questions about conviction rates and about scandals on that topic. However, it's not all an optimistic story of change. Sexual abuse activism was greeted with a high degree of complacency or refusal of change. And there's a nice example of this in a note that my uh, research team found hidden away in the Home Office archives, which um, was uh, describing what the Home Office should do in response to these, these awkward feminist campaigns. Uh, it's there, you, you won't be able to read it, but the, the, the note says in, in classic sort of Whitehall uh, terms, very yes minister. The recommendations of the Committee on Sexual Offences Against Young People have been a great source of embarrassment. Sooner or later, it may be necessary to say outright that many of the committee's recommendations are not acceptable, but this would blow into flame the smoldering agitation of a few very energetic and well-meaning people, AKA the women MPs, whose anxiety to secure convictions for these offences blinds them to the imperative necessity of leaving much to be a matter of judicial discretion. And some of you may know what happened when it was left to the judges. So despite some areas of feminist success, there's been a very strong um, uh, f historical reading of this period that suggests that a lot of this change was very short term. It was based on the political parties scrambling, if you like, in 1918, thinking, we have this new constituency. We're worried about, will they vote for us? We're particularly worried, will they vote on block as women? Uh, and therefore putting um, a range of measures through but realizing after uh, several elections that women did not vote on bloc, that there was not going to be a kind of major earthquake in terms of party affiliations and the political landscape. And so stepping back from that desire for change. We can also see 
that some of those measures that we were talking about were things that had been recommended as part of royal commissions and um, government inquiries before World War I and were then postponed by the war and when they were sorted out in the early 1920s, that was really just unfinished business. It was you know, sorting out issues where the consensus had already been reached before World War I. So we cannot put it all down to the presence of women voters and women MPs. So in the medium term, after that short-term period of change in the early to mid-1920s, in the medium term, we actually see a, really, a, a stepping back from issues like equal pay or women's right to enter the professions or not just a stepping back, a retrogression, such that women lose some of the rights to do things like study medicine uh, in the um, later 1920s. I want to turn now to a final area where there is change, and this is in relation to how women could influence politics. And we've tended to want to see 1918 or possibly 1928 as the two kind of hinge moments where women are invited in to politics. But it's important to set that in a kind of longer historical context and recognize that women had all sorts of forms of political power and forms of participation before 1918. So for example, at elections with rituals of hustings, and here you can see uh, a mixed sex audience um, uh, uh, in, the, in the 1860s, where women would join in with the, um, the, the, the fun to be had of politics, even though they weren't directly vote, voting. So they would be heckling, uh, candidates, they would be wearing party colors, women um, shopped according to their political affiliations, women uh, participated in chairing successful candidates, um, and so on. So women didn't feel that they were not politically active. They were very active in political parties, particularly in the last quarter of the 19th century. And that was partly because women also had some forms of voting. Women were local government voters since uh, 1869 if they fulfilled the property and residence uh, criteria. And women could also stand for, as elected members for certain kinds of um, uh, local government institutions, for poor law uh, guardians, for school boards, for vestry councils, and so on. I don't think they had a particularly easy time of it in those bodies, but they were able to, uh, to stand for them nonetheless. And that was important because local government um, in that period was a much more significant area of expenditure and, and political power than we think of it as being today. So saying that women were electors at the local government level was uh, saying a lot. It was a really important um, way into public life. And those issues that we now regard as really central to our politics, healthcare, uh, infant welfare, education, utilities, and so on, those were the things where innovation was being driven forward in the late 19th century at the local government level. It wasn't only as elected members, but also through informal sources of power. Uh, women were political hostesses. They were uh, informal advisors linked by their networks of, of kinship and friendship uh, to elite men. A very good example of this is uh, uh, Lady Randolph Churchill, uh, Jenny, mother of Winston Churchill, and a serial adulterer with powerful men. She was hugely influential in Victorian and Edwardian politics. She was a voter for the last three years of her life. I've no idea whether she actually bothered to vote. I'm sure she would have thought it can surely make very little difference compared to what I can do in my parties and my, um, my nefarious affairs. And one surprising feature of women's enfranchisement is that some of that form of influence was lost. And that was the kind of informal power brokerage uh, of uh, patronage, of um, salons, and so on, um, falls away somewhat as politics becomes a more mass affair in the 1920s onwards, as politics becomes more mediated. So politicians turn to the radio or to newsreels instead of to hustings or to their, uh, to their female kin. Female relatives adopted a less flamboyant role Stanley Baldwin's wife is perhaps the best example of this. Baldwin used to invite her to sit alongside him as he did his radio broadcasts, and she would be knitting. <laughs> he thought that this would give his voice the right tone, a kind of fireside chat, which um, allowed him to kind of speak out to voters and gain their trust. So that was her role, a million miles away from uh, uh, Jenny Churchill and her affairs. Okay, so now let's turn to areas where 
uh, we don't see much change. And I'm going to talk, first of all, about personnel. What happened to all those suffrage activists? Surprisingly few went on into politics. Emmeline Pankhurst was one who did. She affiliated to the Conservative Party, which was kind of reflective of her um, very strong anti-communist uh, uh, beliefs. Uh, but she died just before she was to contest the Whitechapel seat in the 1929 general election. Some went to, uh, to fascism after their involvement in militant suffrage activism had given them a taste for uniforms, for marching, for law-breaking, for military-style uh, uh, discipline. And you can see here Mary Allen, um, uh, who was, uh, I think, the best-known suffragette who went on into uh, the British Union of Fascists. Historian Hilda Keane has argued that instead of going into uh, formal politics, suffragettes and suffragists turn to history writing. She calls history as the new militancy, which I, I like very much as a historian. <laughs> Major histories of the, un uh, of, of the women's movement were produced by Ray Strachey, who talked about the kind of constitutionalist version, and Sylvia Pankhurst writing about the militants. Of course, a small number of women were elected into politics. About 2 to 4% of the House was female in the years, in the decades, I should say, after enfranchisement. Perhaps crucially, there, were no, there was no kind of concentration of women or feminists in any one party. If you look at the graph here, I hope you can all see, you can see that up until the late 80s, there's um, barely uh, an increase in numbers. Uh, there's, a, there's a story to be told about what happens after that. But women's uh, participation in politics as elected members of parliament is um, uh, a slow burner, shall we say. Let's have a look at uh, uh, how to explain better this uh, rise that we see in the, in the late 20th century. You can see here that this is better explained by the divides between parties. So the red line there, which is Labour, sees Labour climbing to a um, uh, unprecedented high in terms of women um, MPs uh, in the uh, 1990s. And that was because of their electoral calculation after the 1992 general election where it seemed that women's uh, support for John Major had, um, had clinched it for him in, in, in that election. And that led to the adoption from 1993 of all women shortlists, a technique that was quite unpopular within the party, was subject to legal challenge in 1996 and was ruled illegal. But fortunately for women, uh, the, those who had been selected were allowed to still stand in the 1997 um, uh, election, which led to a very sharp rise, as you can see there, for the Labour Party. The numbers then dipped in a subsequent election in 2001, and the Labour Party um, then legislated for all women shortlists to be, um, to be legal in 2002. And we can see um, uh, uh, women rising today to 32% of all MPs. That's a little whisker less than the 33% in local government and the 40% of women as uh, British MEPs today. That's a story. It's a story of change. The change comes much later than I think the feminists of uh, the Edwardian period would ever have expected. It does come, but it's not really the end of the story because we haven't reached 50%. Call me utopian. <laughs> uh, and we should also remember that women are very underrepresented in some of the key uh, roles that sit alongside the elected members uh, if we think about the special advisors that have become very dominant in British politics, uh, women are very woefully underrepresented, and in roles such as um, uh, parliamentary private secretaries. What about party culture? How do parties themselves change? Well, the parties uh, relied on women's support. They relied on women to get the vote out, to make tea, to knock on doors. There were about 300,000 female Labour members in uh, 1927, just before uh, all women were enfranchised, and about a million uh, Tory women. Feminist activists found this party loyalty rather frustrating. They had been irritated by the lack of support of the two major parties, the two Edwardian parties, the Liberals and the Conservatives. Uh, no party was willing to prioritize time for women's suffrage. But their own efforts to found a women's party in 1917 under the Pankhursts had not gained uh, any electoral support. 
Some women chose another route, and they um, uh, stood for Parliament as independents. Here's Eleanor Rathbone, who was one of the most popular and long-lasting. And there was a really strong appeal there for her in saying, look, I'm just campaigning for the issues I believe in. I'm, not, I'm sloughing off the kind of the yoke of party loyalty here. Women who were within the parties did sometimes work together in Parliament. And that was particularly in the early years after enfranchisement when there was um, a body called the Consultative Committee of Women's Organizations, which brought women together to work across party lines. But that declined in the 1930s after the kind of heady days of the 1920s when there was a strong sense of change, of an extraordinary opportunity to do things differently. By the 1930s, party lines had really reasserted themselves, especially for the Labour Party. They had slightly more women than the Conservatives and um, a real fear in the Labour Party that feminists and women's interests would be a kind of fifth column, that it would distract the Labour Party from its historic mission, uh, uh, just as they were also at this period very fearful of the entryism on the, on the far left of the communists. They, they kind of put fem feminists in the same uh, category as the communists. In the Conservative Party, uh, uh, again, uh, very few ministerial roles for women and um, a tendency to want to keep women in support levels at the grass level. So women absolutely were making the tea in those Conservative Party, uh, party bodies. The Labour Party had the honour of appointing uh, the first uh, female cabinet minister in 1929, the wonderful Margaret Bomfield. Um, uh, who, was a, who was a tough operator in politics. Uh, but there was no other woman in any cabinet role until 1945. Finally, I'm going to talk a little bit about the kind of broader political cultures of politics. The way in which politics uh, in Britain was conducted continued to be characterized by misogyny. Nancy Astor, who was the first woman to take up her seat, in the House of Commons, recalled that when she first entered Parliament, Churchill said to her, I felt when you entered the House of Commons that a woman had entered my bathroom and I had nothing to protect myself with but the sponge. <laughs> it was clearly discomposing to have women enter those spaces that had been dominated by homosocial practices of drinking and smoking and debating. Women were offered separate facilities uh, in the House of Commons, and certainly not equal facilities. They recall having to time uh, visits to the toilet um, very carefully because it was such a long way to get to the women's toilets in the basement. Female MPs did not feel that they had equal access to the social spaces of uh, the House of Commons. They were given a small room to powder their noses, but prevented from being in the smoking rooms and bars where all the business and the deal-making was being done. Women only gained the right to sit in the House of Lords as life peers in 1958 and as hereditary peers in 1963. So they were incredibly late to enter that other place uh, and to get um, a, a presence in, in, in that chamber. Their low numbers in the Lords and the Commons meant that they were continually, until that, that, that uptick that we see in the 80s, um, which really gathers pace in the 1990s, they were continually regarded as exceptional. One recalled being pointed out to visitors, in her words, as if I was a giant panda. <laughs> and we know from recent scandals over sexual uh, harassment and bullying in the House of Commons that there was a darker side to that, uh, that exceptionality, that women, uh, often in quite junior roles, were not well treated in the political world. Outside of Parliament, there were still assumptions that women voters were frivolous, that they were easily distracted, that they weren't capable of serious political engagement. And despite the Labour Party being the single national party which supported women's suffrage consistently from 1912, they were a very small party, of course, and had never been in power at that point, but nonetheless, they, their support is, uh, is, is historically important. Despite that, the Labour leader, Ramsay MacDonald, blamed his party's losses in 1918 in the general election on women voters who he, he described as bloodthirsty and governed by wild emotion. When, uh, if ever, does this change? I think the Labour Party learns to love its female supporters in the 1960s. There's certainly more uh, uh, space given to their concerns, and you have um, figures like Barbara Castle uh, as very important front, front benches. <laughs> 
In the 1970s, left-wing uh, women's political energies turned away from formal politics and turned towards the women's liberation movement. Um, they were very wary of the kind of um, uh, the, the, the losses that were um, suffered by women who engaged in formal politics. And I would say it's not until the 1980s that you start to get real feminist interest in what's happening in Parliament. You start to get a determination to drive up the numbers of women MPs. You start to get uh, campaigns like Claire Short's attempts to, to ban uh, the Sun's page three coming out of Parliament and making it seem as though Parliament does have a, uh, a feminist voice. Under Tony Blair, as we know, there were re record numbers of uh, women MPs, but still a strong sense of a kind of laddish, all-male clique surrounding Brown uh, and Blair, a very sort of bullying and um, aggressive culture. Very little culture change then to accompany the large numbers of uh, female MPs that, as you will remember, were patronizingly called Blair's babes. The Conservative Party uh, across the second half of the 20th century was much less able to attract women to stand and much less willing to put them into leadership roles, but did, of course, manage to put two women right to the top as prime ministers, Margaret Thatcher and Theresa May. But also a tendency to want to slip back into uh, the male dominance of cabinets, and it's, uh, I think, um, indicative of that culture that when John Major proposed his first cabinet, when he came to power in 1990 after Thatcher had um, resigned, that there was not a single woman in that cabinet. So a very slow change there uh, within both parties. The overall message that I have today is that we need to see those suffrage victories in 1918 and 1928 in this larger context. This is the large story that we need to be telling. It's all too easy to tell a story where we celebrate our, for, uh, our foremothers. And of course, we do celebrate them, but we want to remember that the national suffrage was not the first time that women had exercised political power. There were other realms of political power, which we also need to, to keep in view. And also that just being voters and just being MPs was not really the end of the story. The dominance of mainstream parties across this period has really limited the purchase that the kind of activist feminist presence might have had. And we need to think about those issues of short, medium, and long-term change and try to weigh up uh, 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 those, those, those different um, paces of change. Because some changes took many decades to emerge in the aftermath of suffrage. And so this historical perspective can help us understand this big picture of women's and feminist political activism uh, in Britain. Okay, thank you. <laughs>
move afoot to have a separate university, like a woman's university, um, and you say that might not have been a good idea. Out, out of interest, I mean, how close did they get to kind of getting it going? And of course, you have in America quite a lot of very famous mm. all women in colleges and universities. Do they look at that as a model p for potentially for this uh, separate university? Yeah. Uh, it didn't come very close to getting going, just as the, the, the proposal for the third chamber for women um, never really got off the kind of fly sheets um, of the debates. Um, I think it, the, the problem with it was, in, in Cambridge, was that you would have had to have unpicked the already very extensive collaboration between um, uh, the women's and the men's colleges, between the, uh, the lecturers, who were mostly uh, uh, male-appointed lecturers who were teaching uh, in the women's colleges, um, and the, you know, the shared examining structure and so on. So it wouldn't have been just setting up a women's university. It would have been, you know, excising women as they already existed within the University of Cambridge. Yes. Just to ask a supplemental question. Um, do you think that the people, when they founded Girton, and they, that they felt they were on a journey and one day it would come to 1948? Or do you think they felt it might never come or do you think there was the sense of, you know, one day yeah. we will have full yeah. equality? Certainly the, the founders of Girton absolutely expected it would come, and they had, uh, uh, I think, no thought that it would be as long as, as until 1948. Uh, Newnham uh, was founded with a slightly different vision. They were more flexible about um, the outcomes that they saw for their students. They were happy for students to come up for several terms and just get a kind of a smattering of education. Um, Emily Davis was absolutely committed to women graduating on exactly the same terms as men. So she definitely was expecting a, a, a female degree. Yes. Uh, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> yes, this lady here in the turquoise. Christine Taken, and I'm actually a, a government regulator. And I've recently been on the receiving end of an extraordinarily aggressive select committee, um, completely out, out of order from my point of view. Mm. And I think a lot of what, when you're talking, you, we look back in horror at the things that took so long to sort out. And in my view, I think um, culture and behaviour and the way people talk to each other in Parliament is something that in 50 years we will look back on and in the same horror. I wondered whether you agree and whether there's any other things that you think that we should actually be ourselves much more um, campaigning about now to try and sort out. Mm. Uh, well, you, you, you can speak to this better than I can, it sounds. But um, yes, I absolutely agree. And you know, it's been um, interesting when you see people who do try to break out of that culture, as I think Jeremy Corbyn did in his early days. Um, uh, it's, it's extraordinarily hard to do that. You, you, know, you cannot uh, uh, command the floor of the house unless you follow its conventions. So will we look back in 50 years with horror? Um, I'm not sure this is one where we'll see fast change, actually. I don't, I don't see any particular impetus for change on that front. Um, that said, uh, I, I still think that the um, ever-increasing number of women's MPs does change the culture of the House, and we can see that, particularly in relation to long hours and childcare facilities and breastfeeding in the chamber and so on. These are all very, very recent changes, and I think they're, that, that's the place where I'd say that exciting change is happening. Um, this is a slightly similar question. Um, Alison Petch, I came here in 1968, but um, invite you to do a bit of crystal ball gazing mm. in terms of what might be the areas of progress and the areas without progress over the next, say, 30, 50 years. Oh, that's a, <laughs> that's a challenging question. <laughs> um, you know, historians are always reluctant to look into the future uh, <laughs> we're much better at looking, looking back. Um, one of the things that is, makes the crystal ball very cloudy at the moment is the fact that we have, I think, radically divergent futures ahead of us. If we look at the level of change that has happened in the last, let's, let's say since 1975 or even 1970 when we've had the Equal Pay Act, 1975 the Sex Discrimination Act, and we've had various other really important equalities acts since then, a lot of the impetus for that change has come from Europe, from our membership or our prospective membership of the European community. So um, 
Europe is a complicated project and you know has many facets. But on the on the facet of gender equality, it has um, stimulated change. It made change happen. For example, uh, it was a European directive that forced us to move from the kind of useless uh, equal pay for equal work campaign to the equal pay for work of equal value. And that in the in the mid 80s was what enabled a whole load of tribunals to to, to rule in favour of women. So uh, without that uh, uh, behind us, really, I would say it's 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 a very, it's an open question as to whether there'll be an, an alternative source of change, internal to the um, to the system. Well, uh, the, the big change I think is going to be: do we see the survival of the big mainstream parties, or do we see a much more sort of viciparous? divided landscape with lots and lots of little parties. If we do have lots of little parties, if the Greens, for example, or even the Women's Equality Party um, uh, gain a more powerful voice as a result, that might be a source of change where we might see things happening. A question at the back there. Uh, my name's Maggie. I'm a musician and bifellow at Girton. We're dealing lot with the university and in life in general about diversity and access, and I wondered whether history and the individual histories of uh, the first women MPs could help us move forward on that, or whether uh, private education and mm. status and money was a recurring feature until extremely recently. Mm. That's a lovely question, Maggie. And um, Nancy Astor, who we've got up on the screen here, um, is uh, the kind of opposite story that we'd, than the one we'd like to tell, which is, yes, it's a meritocracy and people can get through, because she get, got her seat in 1918 as a uh, wealthy um, uh, uh, American heiress, wife of an existing member. He was elevated to the Lords, and she then uh, campaigned and, and, and was elected as his kind of stand-in. You know, it's, it's, it's the opposite of an access story. Um, but I showed you Margaret Bomfield. Um, uh, and she is a, uh, you know, came through the, the, the labor movement and came from a, um, a lower middle class background. I would say that for those um, women M MPs uh, who got there, the increasing access to a sort of a wider range of opportunities in the education system was important. The grammar school education was behind a lot of those women MPs, even if they came from um, working class or lower middle class backgrounds. Um, but. But actually, still, there's a lot of, of um, uh, aristocratic power that remains embedded in politics. Um, so I, I, I'm not sure that those MPs are going to give us that story. Nancy Astor, however, you know, she came in as this unpromising wife of peer and turned out to be a really dogged campaigner for women. She, she said herself uh, on her um, entry, I don't really know what this is all about. You know, I don't really know anything about the women's movement. But she appointed Ray Strachey as, as her secretary. Uh, who had been really prominent in the suffrage uh, movement and um, was willing to accept a great deal of advice and guidance and became a really um, uh, unifying figure for, for, for women's activism. Well, I'm afraid I think we're out of time. Um, so uh, in a moment, I'll ask you to thank Lucy, but uh, before we do that, an advert. Um, Lucy and I are co-curating an exhibition on the history of women at the University of Cambridge since 1869. It will be opening in the middle of October at the University Library. Um, you're very welcome to attend. We hope you will come. With that said, I think you'll agree it's been a fascinating discussion. Thank you all for your questions. And can we end by please thanking very much our speaker, Lucy Delap. Thank you very much.